Well, thank you for being here tonight. I am aware that, that most of you do not know me. As Jonathan mentioned, uh, I did make an appearance here. I'm a native Alabamian, but, but I, uh, I am also a former Tampa resident. August of 2023, my wife Katie and I uh, uh, lived here. And uh, as we were waiting for our daughter to be released from the hospital. And so uh, that was an interesting experience. During that time, we stayed with the Hammond Trees. And that's not totally random. Their daughter Elizabeth and husband Brock actually worship where I preach there in Coleman, Alabama. And so we knew Joe and Margaret a little bit. I wouldn't say we knew them well enough to be like, hey, let's live together for a month. But we did know them some. Uh, and, and so that actually... Uh, is what happened. Overall, things went pretty well. Uh, at one time, Joe was actually talking to some of you, some of you empty nesters that had plenty of room in your homes. He was just in case we needed other options. Uh, there was some of that, but all in all, I think things ended pretty well. Uh, last, uh, last I heard, at least, uh, I think by the time we left, things were so good, I had worked my way into his will. So, uh, anxious to see how that turns out, but uh, it's always good to be able to, to, to come back to a place that uh, you have some familiarity with, and I have a very short time here, but I also do have some, uh, some memories here. When Brother Truex told me what this series was all about, uh, about pick something that you have some fire about, and I immediately thought about the home, and I need to tell you that I didn't think about the home because I have all the experience or because I have perfected my home, uh, far, far from it as a matter of fact. But it is the season of life that I'm in right now, raising four daughters. And so it's, it's a fire of mine, it's a passion of mine right now, just because that's the season of life that I'm in. As a matter of fact, back home, our theme this year at my local congregation is creating godly homes. And so I wanted to share some of that with you tonight. And I don't think I have to, to do a lot of explaining as to why the idea of creating godly homes is so important. It's really all about Satan. And, and Satan is the enemy, and we know that he's good at what he does. As a matter of fact, the very first thing that we read about Satan is that he is crafty. And I don't think it's very hard for us to, to see how he's having a, a, a lot of influence in the entire world around us. I mean, just think about uh, he's having some influence in our schools, certainly in this digital world, everything that we see online, and the way that we entertain ourselves, uh, in the workplace. Unfortunately, sometimes even in the church, we see Satan having some, some success and, and obviously lots of influence, but it might be that some of his most effective work is being done in our homes. As a matter of fact, I would suggest the success that he's having in all of those other places, the battles he's winning in, in all of those other places, is because he's first winning battles in our homes. And that's what we want to avoid. Uh, a lot of this is based on those famous words of Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, where Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Uh, serve the Lord. Those need to be the, the words of, of our home. That's what needs to define our homes as we, we serve the the Lord. And so we're going to talk about some of that tonight. Uh, here in just a little while, I'm going to give you some things from Joshua chapter 24. If you got a handout when you came in tonight, that's what that's all about. You don't need that right now, so just put it away and I'll tell you when you can get that out. That'll be kind of the last thing we do. So we're going to talk about defending our homes, but before we do that, I think it's important to talk about how our homes are under attack. So we're going to spend a little bit of time just thinking about all the different ways that Satan is kind of working, specifically working in our homes. And I don't think I'm going to surprise you with anything that I'm about to tell you, but I want you to see just how many different ways Satan can work in our homes. And some of these are more obvious than others. Some of them may be rather subtle, but, but here's what I mean. When I'm talking about our homes being under attack, I'm talking about broken homes. And of course, there are lots of different ways that, that a home might be considered broken. I'll give you a few of them. For instance, there are fewer people 
people who are getting married. And it's not that they aren't still getting in significant relationships. It's not that they're not still living together. It's just that they're, they're not getting married, and that's problematic. Of course, divorce rates are high for the people who do get married. And that's not anything new. You've probably heard that talked about from, from this very pulpit about the, the, the divorce rates, and they're high. And even, even among believers, divorce rates are high, and I don't think they're going to go down anytime soon. And of course, then there are single parent homes. And I'm not going to do a deep dive on statistics, but there was one that really stood out to me. Uh, I saw this not too awful long ago from October of last year. October of last year, there was a statistic that said that in America, there are almost 11 million single parent homes. Will you take a minute and just try to wrap your mind around that? That in America, there are almost 11 million single parent homes. And of those 11 million single parent homes, almost 80% of them are headed by women which means, statistically, one in every five children are being raised in a home without a father. If you want to know how Satan is winning the battle in the home, the numbers tell the story. And so Satan is certainly able to attack our homes through, through things like that. You, and so you have all kinds of things that are, at, that are at work there. You've got homes where there's no marriage to start with, and then you've got homes where the marriages are, are ending in divorce, and you've got single-parent homes. And of course, today, you've got homes where the makeup may not even look all that familiar to, to somebody 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, where you, now you have two-parent homes that might be two moms or two dads or some other distorted combination. But, but you see that when the makeup of the home is broken, then Satan has lots of room to work. Here's the second thing, misfocused homes. And I think misfocused homes are really, really dangerous. They're very deceitful because when I'm talking about a misfocused home, I'm not talking about a home where there's a lot of immorality going on. I'm literally just talking about a home where, where there's, there's uh, too much uh, going on, where, where the focus is just too divided. And, and, and so a misfocused home is deceptive because it has maybe all the right people in it. We just talked about homes that don't have all the right people in it. But what I want you to see is you can have a home with all the right people in it, but that, that alone doesn't make it what it needs to be because the home with all the right people may just have the wrong focus. And, and again, I say that's dangerous and deceptive because a, a, a misfocused home can be a very good home in, in, in maybe lots of different ways. Uh, uh, I have a... Uh, a friend of mine that's a, that's a preacher close to where I am, and he was telling me a while back about a young man in his congregation was graduating high school. He was a football player, and it was his dream, his hope, his aspiration was to play college football. And this young man is in small town Alabama, so not really good enough to get noticed by anything major. But that was what he had set his heart to do, was to play college football. And so, and so he found a, an opportunity to play at a small junior college several hours north away from home somewhere. And so he makes the, the commitments to play, all the arrangements have been made, and, and, and he's literally down to moving day. And my friend asked him, the preacher asked him, just kind of really out of curiosity, he said, where are you going to worship? What church are you going to go to? And the young man just looked at him. He's like, I, I don't know. He had not even thought yet about the place where I'm moving. Is there even a is there even a church there nearby that I can go and a place to worship? Is there a church there that I might could be a part of? And I will tell you, I think he was old enough to have thought through those things himself, but do you know the first question that came to my mind when I heard that? Where are the parents? How have parents allowed their child to get this far into a moving process? How have they allowed their child to go this far down the decision-making path, and it's not even yet come up, is there a church where you're going to live? Do you see the danger in a home where the focus is misplaced? That was a major life decision being made. 
at a very critical time. I don't know if there's a more critical time in a person's life than when they're leaving home for the very first time. And so here you have a situation, by all accounts a good home, but at a major crossroads in life, at a very, very critical time, here's a decision being made, and they haven't even thought about the spiritual implications yet. And listen, that kind of stuff can happen in lots and lots of different ways, but do you see how Satan can easily get in there and start winning some battles? It might not be with the kids. It might be mom and dad making a a, a career choice or a a job choice or a move choice. Sometimes we have to, to make those decisions for our family. But can you imagine making that kind of choice and not thinking about the spiritual implications? Uh, What will this do to me spiritually? What will it do to our family? Will this allow me to to be involved when the church is uh, doing stuff? And listen, can you imagine taking a job and not thinking about what it's going to pay you? I don't think anybody here would sign up, certainly wouldn't move somewhere and take a job, and then after the fact ask, oh, by the way, can you tell me what this is going to pay? Now, if you wouldn't do that financially... Why spiritually? I I, I think in a, a, a home where there is a spiritual focus, those kind of questions get answered first. And if we can't get through the spiritual stuff, then there's no point talking about the rest of the stuff. Maybe it just has something to do with the, the busyness of life. And listen, this is really just all about putting so much on our plates that we've, we've got more than we can handle. That's a, a, a battle that we face back home in our congregation like you guys. We try to do several things throughout the year. We want to have a VBS. We want to have a, a teen weekend. We want to have all of these different things to, 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 to grow and to edify and to, to invite people to. But it feels like sometimes when we're sitting down figuring out when can we do this, it takes forever to figure out a time when we could count on people to show up because we're competing with all this other stuff in the world. And listen, it might be sports, it might be band, it might be some other hobbies, and I don't have a problem with any of those things. But I will tell you, this stuff that that keeps us busy six or seven days a week is going to have to take a back seat if we don't want Satan winning battles in our home. The idea of seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness is all but lost. And I will tell you, if God God is not first, Satan has a lot of room to start working in our homes. Here's another thing. How about the social pressures? And I think in the digital age that we live in, this is probably bigger than it's ever been before because because we scroll and we scroll and we scroll. And as we're scrolling, we're seeing the lives of everybody else. Now, I will contend we're not really seeing the lives of everybody else. We're seeing the parts that they want us to see. Their life is in all likelihood, it's not any more glamorous than mine. They just take more time taking the perfect picture and staging everything. But you know how this goes when we, when we scroll and we see the, the, the things that other people have, what they're wearing, what they're driving, the experiences they have. What does that make you think? Oh, I need those things too. I want those things too. And so often we're, we're driven by all of that. I was listening to a financial consultant the other day, and they were talking about the, the, the massive number of people who have car payments over $1,000 a month. And maybe you've got that. I don't really care what your car payment is. I'm just listening to financial consultants talk, and they're talking about about the the amount of money that people are spending, and they attribute it all to status consumption. If you know what status consumption is, in a nutshell, status consumption is where the motivation behind your purchase is to make some kind of statement. You can't necessarily justify the economic value of it. What's really motivating this particular purchase, what's really motivating it, is some kind of statement. It's all about perceived social status. And it's, again, it's not just cars. It may be houses or clothes, clothes or vacations. And, and maybe that seems a little bit innocent. And maybe we spend a little bit more than we should to have some nicer things. But can I show you how that can be maybe more dangerous than you recognize? Some point last year, I was spending some time with a, a gentleman local to home and And uh, we were having a conversation, and he was telling me how expensive his kids are. And I think maybe that's just what dads do sometimes. We just sit around and we talk about how expensive our kids are. 
So in this conversation, it was a, a pretty lengthy conversation, and he's kind of telling me a little bit about his history, and he's telling me about his kids. They are, they're high school students at this point, and, but he's talking about all the things that they've been involved in throughout their lives and all the stuff that's consumed the time and the money, and we're talking about competitive cheer and travel ball and all of those things. And, and, and he says now they're in high school. And now in high school, they're feeling the pressure to have all the things that everybody else has. And so they're coming to him. They need the expensive shoes. And, and he said, they came to me and they needed a Lululemon sweatshirt. And he didn't know what that was. So he goes to look it up online and it was a $125 sweatshirt. I'd like for us to just be real honest and think, I don't know that anybody really needs a $125 sweatshirt. I'm imagining there's a knockoff version out there somewhere that'll do a pretty good job. I happen to know Miss Margaret loves thrift store shopping, so if you really want one of those, maybe she could find you one second hand and save you some money. But he's telling me all of this, the, the, the travel ball, the competitive cheer, the expensive shoes, the expensive sweatshirt. He's telling me all of this to explain why he's working seven days a week. He had his regular job, and in addition to that, he's picking up side jobs. He's never home. There's not time to go to church. That's his own admission, because he's working to pay for all the stuff. You remember in the beginning, I mentioned all those single-parent homes? Those statistics don't include his home, because technically, that's not a fatherless home. But do you see how in some ways it's a fatherless home? Because dad's out there working to pay for all the stuff. We've got to be, we got to be careful that our home is not too much about status because if my home becomes too much about status, the pressure, uh, the pressure builds and the focus is on something else and now Satan has lots of work to go. Or how about hypocritical homes? Parents, we've got, to be, we've got to be incredibly careful. We can put on a good face for worship. And we can be here and we can look the part. And the elders just assume that we're who we need to be and the preachers assume that and all the rest of the people assume that because they, they see us here and we're, we look good in our Sunday best. And, and then though, behind the scenes... Things might look differently. And if things look differently behind the scenes, then nobody else may know that. But do you know who does know that? If your home does not have a spiritual focus, the elders may not know it, the preachers may not know it, the people sitting around you tonight may not know it, but do you know who absolutely does know it? Your children know that. Your children know what's important in your life and what's not. And so we have to be certain that we're not just putting up some religious front, putting on a good face for worship. If God is not first, then our children know that. And what our children see in us spiritually will drastically affect how they view spiritual things. Can I tell you it's not in the pews where you prove your allegiance to God? Think about that. It's not in the pews where you prove your allegiance to God. You need to be in the pews, and I'm glad that you're here, and you need to keep doing those things. And it's an opportunity to, to show your children that, that being here is important, and, and it's important especially on a Wednesday night when lots and lots of other people don't come to a, a, a service like this. It's important to show that we're going to make time to do that. But I contend that what happens in the home, that's what's going to drastically impact my children's faith. One last thing is immorality. And by immorality, I don't mean that the family is actively involved doing immoral things. I think that would kind of be a given that Satan's winning that battle. But what I mean is what comes into our home, and I'm thinking specifically what comes into our home via technology. What are we entertaining ourselves with? What are we, what are we watching? What are we, what's coming in on our, uh, through our screens and our devices? How careful are we 
to the things that we're exposed to, the, the kind of stuff the world is offering. There was a, a recent study that I saw that suggested that some kids spend as much as eight hours a day on a device. Think about that. Eight hours a day on a device. I heard that and I immediately thought of what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 where he says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. And I think the idea there is that that these things are going to be the regular things that you dwell on. It's not just an occasional thing that you're going to, you're, you're going to think about. These are the things that you, that you spend your time thinking about. And I will tell you, young or old, if you're spending anywhere near eight hours a day on a device, not only are you not making time to dwell on the good stuff, but in all likelihood, you're bringing in lots and lots of things that are going to take you in the opposite direction. I will tell you, I have major concerns about parents who, who allow their young children, even their teenagers, to have phones that don't have uh, uh, a, a real accountability that don't have any monitoring or very little monitoring. There's not a social media platform out there that that doesn't have its share of immorality. And then there's the pornography pandemic. And then there's just YouTube and the YouTube atheist and the YouTube uh, theology people. and, And it just doesn't take long to start scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, and before you know it, Satan has won a battle with our children. And so we've got to be very careful about what we allow to come into our homes. Because if we don't be very careful, if we're not very careful about what we allow to come in, then we're giving Satan a lot of room to work. Are you all with me? Do you all see this? There's no shortage of ways that Satan can get into our homes and he can start working. And so I'm not going to leave it at that. There are some answers, and this is is where you can, can get that handout out. There are some answers. There are some things that will help us to defend our homes. I want you in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. while you're turning there, I'll tell you why I gave this little handout to you. It's not just so that you can better follow along tonight. What I really hope you'll do is take that with you and give it some thought past just what we're doing here tonight. Sometimes back home when I give out something like that, I call it fridge material. Because it's this kind of stuff that is good to to put in a prominent place where on a regular basis, I'll be reminding myself of those things. And so knowing the, the kind of attack that our homes are under, let me give you some things that will defend our homes. And here's the first one. We have to be decisive. And that's pretty easy. You remember Joshua's famous words there I mentioned to, to Israel in verse 15. Joshua says, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Do you see the choice that, that, that Joshua is, is placing before the people? It starts with being decisive. We have to make that choice. We just have to sit down and we have to decide that this is what our house is going to be. Our house is going to serve the Lord. That's the decision we have to make. And so Joshua is calling for a decision, but he's also causing, calling for some, some urgency. Do you see that? He says, choose for yourselves win. Choose today. Choose today that we are going to serve the Lord. That's not the kind of thing that we need to just get around to sometime. You and I need to choose today, today, 
we make the decision that we are going to serve the Lord. I can promise you Satan is not waiting around, and if he's not waiting around, we don't need to be waiting around either. So be decisive. Just make the choice in your home. We're going to serve the Lord. Here's the second thing. We have to be intentional. It's one thing to decide that we're going to serve the Lord. I don't know about you, but I start way more things than I finish. I have really good intentions. Sometimes it has to do with my eating habits. Sometimes it has to do with my workout habits. Sometimes it has to do with my, my work habits. There are lots and lots and lots of things. Maybe it's just some home projects. But I have good intentions of, of, of starting things but I don't ever see a lot of those things through to the end. Maybe I do it for a little while, then I, then I kind of quit and I move on to something else. And so I have made the choice to, that I'm going to do a lot of things, but I don't follow through with doing all of those things. And that's why it's not only important to be decisive, but we have to be intentional so that we make these things happening. Uh, make these things happen. What we do in our home, what we don't do in our home, the, the, the kind of conversations that we're going to have, the amount of time that we spend doing spiritual things versus other things. Do you see in our homes what we have to really be intentional about is creating the right atmosphere? We've got to create the right atmosphere and the, the kinds of conversations we have and the, the way we prioritize our schedules. Godly homes don't happen by accident. And so we need to be very aware of that. I've got to be, uh, be decisive. I've also got to be very intentional about that. I, I think about uh, the words of Moses in Deuteronomy as he's preparing the children of Israel to go live in a corrupt land. There in chapter 6, he says, he says, diligently teach your sons. And he says, you should talk about the commandments of God. You remember this? When you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. When I read those words, that's kind of my mind is, in my home, I've got to be intentional about the kinds of things that we talk about. And it seems as if he's, he's kind of painting this picture of just take whatever opportunities you can find. If it's an opportunity in the morning, if it's an opportunity in the evening, somewhere along the way, take the opportunities. And I think that is critical for, for defending our homes. We all have those, those morning moments, especially when school's in. I don't know what, what it looks like on a school morning in your home, but it's pretty hectic. We're trying to make sure everybody's got their hair brushed and their teeth brushed and their lunch packed, and, and it's all we can do sometimes to just get out the door on time. But you know what? Even in those moments, you know what would be a good thing to do? Be very intentional about what kind of home we have and what kind of people we have. Can we find a minute just to, to pray together as a family before we leave? And then when we, everybody comes back, can we, can we sit around the dinner table maybe and, and, and have some important conversations about what's going on in our lives and, and why we do things and why we don't? Can we have some important conversations in our homes about what the preacher's preaching about or what we're talking about in Bible class? But those are the things that we have to do. We've got to capture the moments through the busyness of life. And listen, I don't think it's some magical formula. I don't, uh, formula. I don't think it's a uh, do this Devo and it's a surefire way to make sure your kids are faithful. I don't think you can stamp a, a, a time uh, um, limit on it and say just do this much time every day. Rather, it's being intentional, just using the time that we have. Here's the third thing is we have to be different. You've got to be willing to be different. You know this if you've tried to, to be a faithful disciple any length of time in this world. It sets you apart and it makes you a lot different than the people that live around you, the people that go to school with you, the people that, that work with you, maybe even the people in your family. And all of us, I think, are subject to that status consumption. We all feel the pull of the social pressure. We all, we all feel that, the desire to fit in. And sometimes that strong desire to fit in and that strong desire to be like everybody else works real hard against that, me and my house are going to serve the Lord. I think that's a tension we all probably feel. And did you notice in the text that we read, Joshua plainly says there are other choices. 
There are other gods that you could go back to. And I think he probably knew what, what we know. Is there are going to be lots of people who don't choose the God of heaven. And so when you do choose the God of heaven over the gods of this world, it's going to make you drastically different than everybody else. And what that means is we're going to be in the minority, and that means maybe we need to be having some real conversations in our home that we're just going to be different. And that means regular conversations maybe as to, to why we don't dress this way or why we don't watch these things or why we don't go to these places or why we do go to these places. That's what I mean about the willingness to be different. And don't be afraid to talk about we're different. We've got to be sincere. I've already kind of mentioned this, that one of the worst things that we can do as parents is be hypocritical. I think, though, in... Joshua 24, verse 14, he says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth. In sincerity. Directly at the heart of the hypocrisy. And we decide that we're going to, to serve the Lord. Then we can't be pretenders. And we can't just put on a good face for Sunday morning. But that we sincerely love God and we honor Him in the way that we live our lives every day. And I've already mentioned, I don't think it's in the pews where we prove our allegiance to God. I think it's in the, the hundreds of decisions that we make day after day after day, week after week, and month after month, and year after year after year. It's all those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of decisions that show who our allegiance is to. That's what we need to be showing our children as we create godly homes. And then here's the final thing. I think it would be good to be reflective. Constantly reminding ourselves, constantly having conversations in our homes, about who God is and what God has done. Can I get you to just go to the very beginning of Joshua chapter 24, just to kind of show you this? Joshua 24, beginning in verse 1. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and their judges and their officers and they presented themselves before God. And notice what Joshua said to all the people. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, from ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I, I, God, I took your father from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan. And I, God, I multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. And to Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. And to Esau, I gave Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I, I sent Moses and Aaron. And I plagued Egypt by what I did in its midst. And afterward, I brought you out. I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And Egypt pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. But when they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your own eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness for a long time. Then I brought you into the land of the Amorites who lived beyond the Jordan, and they fought with you. And I gave them into your hand, and you took possession of their land when I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and summoned Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I was not willing to listen to Balaam, so he had to bless you. And I delivered you from his hand. You crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the citizens of Jericho fought against you. And the Amorite, and the Perizzite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Girgashite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Thus I gave them into your hand. Then I sent the hornet before you. And it drove out the two kings of the Amorites before you, but not by your sword or bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, 
and cities which you had not built, and you have lived in them. You are eating of vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now, he says, now serve the Lord in sincerity. I think it is important that in our homes we constantly remind ourselves and our families of what God has done and why God is worthy of honor in our home. Thank you for listening tonight. That is a lot to absorb. And again, this is like any sermon, but what I've said will be most effective if you'll take those things with you and you'll give some real thought to it moving forward. And so here's the challenge. I want to challenge you to take those things home, and as a husband, a wife, a mom, a dad, I want you to sit together as a family, and I want you to make these decisions together, and I want you to make these commitments together. I want you to sit down, and I want you to have this conversation as a family that we're going to serve the Lord, and, and we're going to be intentional about that, and it's going to make us different. But what you're going to see out of mom and dad, you're going to see us sincerely serve the Lord. And so that's what I challenge you to do. Our homes are vulnerable, but we can defend them. And I hope that's what we'll do. Thank you for your attention tonight.